HanselMinutes.com. It's Hansel Minutes, a weekly discussion with web developer and technologist Scott Hanselman, hosted by Carl Franklin. This is Lawrence Ryan announcing show number 101, recorded live Wednesday, February 20th, 2008. Support for Hansel Minutes is provided by Telerik RED Controls, the most comprehensive suite of components for Windows Forms and ASP.NET Web applications. Online at www.telerik.com. And by .NET Developers Journal, the world's leading .NET developer magazine. Online at www.sys-com.com. In this episode, Scott talks with theoretical physicist and author, Dr. Michio Kaku. Hi, this is Scott Hanselman, and this is another episode of Hansel Minutes. In fact, our 101st episode, and we are sitting here backstage at Microsoft Tech Ready 6. I've been fortunate enough to get a moment to sit down with Dr. Michio Kaku, who is the author of Physics of the Impossible, coming out very, very soon. He'll be starting his book tour, and he is a theoretical physicist, co-founder of String Field Theory, and futurist. Thank you very much, sir, for taking the time. Glad to be here. So your new book is really interesting. It's about the impossible made possible. There are so many things that are considered impossible, like invisibility, teleportation, starships, ray guns, time travel. And we physicists actually believe that some of them may be possible in the coming decades, centuries, or even millennia. They don't violate the laws of physics. So I wanted to write a book taking apart, taking apart each of these so-called impossible technologies, showing that in the future we may very well have them. Our descendants may have them. Isn't there a rule in physics that if something is not um, disallowed, then it is mandatory? That's right. There's a famous rule. If it's not forbidden, it's mandatory. So we do believe that it may be possible to make an object invisible, uh, perhaps within uh, a few decades. Teleportation, we can already teleport photons and cesium atoms. Starships, maybe in the next century. So I try to quantify some of these things. So what was it about uh, teleportation in the last 10 years that has just been leaps and bounds? I mean, 15, 20 years ago, you started talking about teleportations, you'd be laughed off the stage. Now we're teleporting things every day. That's right. In fact, physicists even came up with rules saying that it would violate quantum theory to have an object teleport. Ironically enough, we use the quantum theory to teleport photons and cesium atoms regularly. The world's record is to teleport a cesium atom under the Danube River, as well as photons. And we hope to perhaps uh, teleport the first molecule, perhaps within five, ten years. And uh, there's some betting that maybe within 20 years we may be able to teleport viruses and organic molecules. How do you measure something like that? How do you prove that you, in fact, did it and you didn't just uh, blink and miss it? (laughs) Well, we have laser beams that uh, we know that, for example, the polarization or the information contained in an object. And then we have another object on the other side of the Danube River and we teleport that information. So you actually destroy the original. The information is then carried over to this other object. So Captain Kirk, for example, would be destroyed in the process, but he would rematerialize someplace else. And where is he being stored? Is he being stored in something that we're used to, or is he being stored somewhere in a quantum state? Uh, We use what is called quantum entanglement. Uh, Believe it or not, if two objects are brought very close together, their wave functions sort of merge. They sort of become like twins. And so when you separate them, there's an umbilical cord, an invisible umbilical cord separating these two. And if you jiggle one, the other one jiggles um, faster than the speed of light. Einstein didn't like this, but hey, we've tested it in the laboratory, and it really does work. It's very interesting, this idea of proximity affecting so many things. You talk about time travel, and it, fundamental to that is bringing two things that are very large, very close together, but not touching. Uh, that's right. Many times in theoretical physics, uh, we stretch the boundaries of what is known and not known. Uh, for example, I used to teach in my optics course that invisibility is impossible. Light bends in glass, water, we know how it bends, and you cannot make an object invisible. Well, last year at Imperial College London and Duke University in North Carolina, we actually made objects invisible to microwave radiation. Uh, Think of a rock in the middle of a stream. Water flows around the rock so that downstream you don't even know that there was a rock upstream. Now replace the water with light. Light can bend around an object, which we used to think was impossible, reform to make the object invisible. 
Now, just a few months ago, we did it. We, the proof of principle was done in the optical range with red lasers and green lasers. So I would say that within five, ten years, we may be able to make an object invisible at least to one color. Interesting. Now, are these kinds of things happening uh, from within or from from without? I mean, uh, is the person making is the object going to have have a, a pack, or is this going to be an external force acting upon the object? Uh, think of the invisibility cloak of Harry Potter. Uh, we're never going to be that advanced, but for example, uh, the Pentagon is funding this. The Pentagon may have a tank and then put a cylinder, a cylinder around the tank, so that when light hits the cylinder, it follows the cylinder and emerges to the other end, so that the tank is invisible. So the Pentagon has spent billions of dollars on stealth technology. Stealth makes you invisible to radar, but is quite visible to light. You can see a stealth bomber with your naked eye. So in the future, the stealth bomber may actually disappear. That's the goal of the Pentagon, anyway. Interesting. That just that makes me think of Predator because he was invisible, but there was just a shimmer, just a, a flaw. The eye is so good at telling when something is not right. That's the goal. The goal is to make an object invisible so that maybe you would see a little glimmer as the person walked by. Interesting. Now, within the context of, of ray guns and lasers, I know that the Army and uh, a number of riot police already have microwave-emitting lasers that will make your skin feel like you're on fire. So use it for riot control and crowd control. Yeah, you know, people often ask the question, we have laser beams. We can drill a hole through a brick wall with a laser beam. So why don't we have handheld ray guns that you see in Star Wars? Well, the answer is very mundane, but very interesting. There are no handheld power packs, big enough, powerful enough to be placed in your hand. That's the reason. We can build a ray gun that'll blast through steel, blast through brick, just like you see in the movies. The problem is you need a nuclear power plant on the other side <laughs> to energize it. So it's not very practical. We need a power pack that you can put in your hand. It seems that with the the movement towards green and, and energy and ecology, you know, being responsible as 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 we uh, you know at Microsoft work on technologies that are going to be more energy efficient, there is this uh, perhaps this is already happening. There's there's this power science field that is just going to become so fundamentally important. I mean, I can't keep my laptop going for more than two hours. How do I expect to get a ray gun to put a? Well, hopefully we can use nanotechnology. Um, nanotechnology is the technology of individual atoms. Right now, we can build an atomic abacus, an abacus made of individual atoms. We can make an atomic guitar, but not much else. We cannot make atomic ball bearings, levers, pulleys, and gears. But one day we will. We'll build an entire atomic factory that's a si smaller than a cell. And so we think that with nanotechnology, we may be able to solve many problems that we can solve today. For example, think of a starship. You think of Captain Kirk in a gigantic enterprise, and you just do the mathematics. The cost would be enormous to send that near the speed of light. Now think of a nanoship, billions of nanoships, each one a computer, that you then send with an electric field near the speed of light. Billions of them to the nearest star. Most of them never make it, but a few of them will make it to the nearest star, and when they come back, you can get all the information you want because of nanotechnology. So nanoships are being looked at by NASA. It's a completely new paradigm, uh, and again, nanotechnology makes this possible. I should also point out that nanotechnology may also save Microsoft and Silicon Valley. Eventually, silicon power will be exhausted. We're going to enter the post-silicon era. Silicon is not stable electronically speaking, at the atomic level. So they're useless as we begin to etch onto individual atoms, transistors as small as atoms. So Silicon Valley could become a rust belt unless we physicists use nanotechnology to create quantum computers rather than silicon computers. Now, I've heard of the context of quantum effects. We're reaching a point where silicon is so small that uh, we're starting to have side effects as things bump into things. How is uh, moving to nanotechnology going to make that easier? There are two problems with Moore's Law. Moore's Law says the computer power doubles every 18 months. But George Harrison said, all things must pass, <laughs> even Moore's Law. By 2020, we're going to be bumping up right up against Moore's Law. Two reasons. One is heat generation. Uh, these chips will generate so much heat, they'll melt, um, they'll melt themselves. You can fry an egg on a Pentium chip of the future. Second of all, uh, your Pentium chip has a layer 20 atoms across today. By 2020, it'll be five atoms across. At that point, leakage takes place. You don't know where the electron is, and the thing short circuits. Mm, mm, mm. 
So if things are continuing to get smaller in the nanotechnology context, how is that not, not a problem? I mean, where's the, uh, where, I don't know where the energy is coming from. Uh, the problem is mass production and wiring of these things. Mm -hmm. We can, let's say, build a transistor made out of individual atoms. Right. A transistor is just nothing but a gate. However, how do you mass produce it? How do you wire it? They're so tiny, you can't see it. You blow on it, the thing, you know, just disappears. So Mother Nature solved these problems three billion years ago. It's called DNA. It's called the nucleus of the cell. It's called the cell. We're trying to duplicate many of the ingenious devices at the nanoscale that nature saw three billion years ago. It's interesting. More and more I'm seeing that uh, scientists are looking at nature to solve their problems rather than trying to build a heart from scratch. We take an existing heart, we reduce it down to its scaffolding, which they've just recently done with rat hearts, and then tell it to build itself back up by seeding it with an individual's skin cells. That's right. Right at the present time, we can create from your own cells skin, bone, heart valves, noses, ears, bladders, um, and within five years, the first liver. Within maybe five, ten years, the first pancreas. So these are your own cells that are grown in a mold and are scaffolding, and then it creates a human body shop. Just like your auto body shop replaces body uh, automobile parts in case of an accident, in case you age or have a disease, we will grow new organs of the body. Now, your new book, Physics of the Impossible, is coming out very, very soon. What are some of the other fantastic technologies that are uh, Like in the book? time travel. Uh, I talk about things that are impossible that may be possible within 10, 20, 100 years. These are called class one impossibilities, like ray guns and starships and invisibility shields, teleportation. But class two impossibilities require thousands of years. For example, time machines, wormhole faster than light rocket ships. These would require much more time because uh, we would have to assemble energy comparable to a star. Mm -hmm. now, we you can't do that yet. <laughs> this is your classification, class one, two, and three? And that's right. And class three impossibilities are impossible with the known laws of physics, such as, for example, reading the future and perpetual motion machines. They probably violate all known laws of physics. Interesting. I, I, I saw the uh, reading the future coming. I didn't think that perpetual motion would be, uh, I guess it would. Uh, yeah. When I was a graduate student getting my PhD, I was really bowled over, fell off my chair, when I finally realized the reason why conservation of energy is true. Mm -hmm. If I have a system that does not change with time, then, if the laws of physics don't change with time, then the system conserves energy. This is called Nerdless Theorem. That's the reason why energy is conserved. The laws, Newtonian physics does not change with time. Quantum physics does not change with time. You can get radiation emitted from the Big Bang. The radiation is identical to radiation we see on the Earth, microwave radiation. Mm -hmm. So the laws of physics haven't changed in 13.7 billion years. We've, yeah, we just discovered them be, to be different than we thought they were. Yeah, so it means that the conservation of energy has mm -hmm. probably held for 13.7 billion years. This is a <laughs> stunning revelation that just blew my mind away when I was a graduate student getting my PhD. Well, who are we to change it? Uh, yeah, you have <laughs> to go to before the Big Bang to alter the laws of physics. And actually, that's what I do for a living. I work in something called string theory, mm -hmm. where we actually do go before the Big Bang. We go before Genesis. And we talk about a multiverse of universes, but that's another book. Uh, yeah. My book, Parallel Worlds, talks about the multiverse of universes. Well, I remember my, my, when, in 1995, when I read Hyperspace for the first time, the idea that here was uh, someone, some context, some topic that was, in my mind, originally inaccessible, was being brought to me, and it was the first time that I'd sat down with a popular science book, other than some, you know, Carl Sagan's books, and... Uh, it was such a powerful experience to be able to, uh, to have that come down to me in the sense that I'm not a Ph.D. student at the City University of New York, and uh, I really appreciate that, uh, that book. So talk to me more about time travel. Well, to build a time machine, and I give a blueprint in the book, you'd have to assemble the energy comparable to that of a star, uh, create a gigantic atom smasher that converges all the energy to a single point, mm -hmm. sufficient to open up a gateway through space and time. The problem is, however, paradoxes. What happens if you go backwards in time and kill your parents before you're born? If you kill your parents before you're born, how can you be born to kill your parents before you're born? The grandfather paradox. Right. And the answer to that is the universe probably splits in half. Time is a river, we think. Einstein said the river can speed up or slow down. Mm -hmm. 
But the river of time may have whirlpools. The river of time may have forks, forks in the river of time. So maybe a parallel universe opens up. And as a consequence, uh, you killed, when you went back into the past, you killed someone who looks like your father and mother, but they're not. They're genetically identical, but they are a parallel mother and father. Now, is that as um, by virtue of the fact that you went back in time, or is every decision, every moment, every atom split, every de you know, de electron decay causing a new universe to split off? Well, there is a theory called many worlds, and believe it or not, it is one of the dominant theories of the quantum theory at the present time, which says that the universe splits every time a decision or a measurement has been made. Mm -hmm. So there are carbon copies of you existing in billions of universes where you marry somebody different, you went to a different college, mm -hmm. became a mass murderer instead of an upstanding citizen, <laughs> or died in infancy, and in these other universes, Elvis Presley is still alive. <laughs> now, this uh, it, does that mean that we are in the most probable universe, or are we just simply we're in this one? According to the quantum theory, we happen to be in one universe among many, many possible universes. Ours is very likely. The probability that we are sitting here having this conversation is quite large. Mm -hmm. But there's also a probability that my wave function is on Mars right now, and that tomorrow I'll wake up on the red planet. I asked my graduate students to calculate the probability you'll wake up on Mars the next day. You will have to wait longer than the lifetime of the universe, but it's possible. It is a, there is a non-zero possibility. That That's you should, right. You I can calculate right the now. probability that you will wake up on Mars tomorrow. Now, a lot of our listeners are, are computer people, we're programmers, and we're typically doing business applications, but I'm interested in what kinds of computer systems are you using? Are you using Mathematica to do this work? What kind of programming are you doing to theorize, or are you just a blackboard guy? Okay, you're not going to believe this, but okay. we physicists work with the mathematics that cannot be placed on a computer, okay? People say, well, everything can be placed on a computer, right? The universe is a computer. Yeah. Well, we work with advanced calculus with what are called super manifolds in hyperspace, mm -hmm. and computers can't calculate, they can't function in that realm, the universe that I work in. Mm -hmm. And so we have to use pencil and paper, and basically, we stare out the window, imagining what surfaces look like in 11-dimensional hyperspace that are mm -hmm. super, super manifolds. Computers cannot work with super numbers. You know that 1 times 2 is, is 2, right? But 1 times 2 does not equal 2 times 1. But with super numbers, 1 times 2 does not equal 2 times 1. And yet, all our mathematics is based on super numbers. That's why it's called super string theory. Mm. And these numbers cannot be placed on computers. Now, how much of this is done with raw horsepower of the mind or versus intuition? How much do you feel? Almost all of it is done with intuition, uh, mainly because the mathematics, a computer is useless for us. Mm -hmm. um, very few of my friends use Mathematica, unless we have a long, long calculation that we have to do. Basically, we stare out the window and play with equations. I assume at this point, after being, having done it for 25, 30 years, you can just do this in your head. Yeah. Uh, most of the time, I stare out the window. Now, my wife thinks that's very strange, because I'm staring out the window all the time, playing with equations drifting in my head. Mm -hmm. But all my friends do this. All my friends who work on string theory stare out the window. It's like a musician. A musician has melodies in his head and plays with these melodies, and that's what we do. That's interesting. Uh, one of the characteristics of the computer person is the, the often a lack of attention or a, 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 a lock of attention, the ability to just literally zone out, go completely away. And I, it seems to be people are either one or the other. They either have ADD or they are uh, hyper-attentive. Well, to be a theoretical physicist, you have to be able to sit on your butt for hours at a time. Look at Newton. Newton spent 18 months basically locking himself in his room working out the greatest masterpiece in the history of science. 18 months locked up. Einstein spent several months working on general relativity. He lost something like 20 pounds uh, working on general relativity. The stress on his body was so great. That's what it takes. How often do you, uh, is, this, is this often a solitary situation, or can you sit down and stare at, at the window with a friend? Um, sometimes we talk to each other. We collaborate on papers. Uh, one time a student of mine was listening in on the conversation. Mm -hmm. And she said that, well, every word was English, but you put all these words together, it meant nothing, absolutely nothing. We use shorthand, shop talk, mm. shop talk to, to uh, express whole blocks of equations. So when we talk to each other, it's English. 
but it's a shorthand for equations. I'm putting you in the spot here, but can you give me kind of an example? Because I know how I would explain, uh, you know, C sharp and .NET programming to my wife, and she would agree that it is English, but I have no idea what you're saying. Well, for example, if we work in Calabi-A manifolds, where we work with so- so-called index theorems, we have to be able to calculate the different index theorems for different m- manifolds in hyperspace. Mm-hmm. And these are super manifolds that exist not just in 11 dimensional space, but 32 dimensional space. So altogether, a 43 dimensional space is what we have to work with. Mm. And it's not something that you can teach a kid. <laughs> That's interesting. So in thinking in the context of children, I have a two-year-old, and I'm wondering when you begin to teach someone uh, the basics and the kind of the general math, how quickly do people who are natural theoretical physicists, do they get up to speed and immediately move beyond? Uh, is this something that you found by 10, 15, you were, you were done and well, you were ready to move on? I have a different on? philosophy. Um, I think it's more a question of interest ra- rather than innate ability. I think by the age of 10, I've interviewed a lot of scientists in my time. Mm-hmm. Uh, I have my own radio show. I'm on 130 radio stations around the country. Mm-hmm. And every time I interview a scientist, I ask them, how did you get interested in science? They always say the same thing. When I was 10, it was a telescope. <laughs> it was a chemistry kit. It was a planetarium visit. That's what set them off. And then by the time they reach 16, it's all over. They discover girls. Peer pressure kicks in. You lost them. So you have six golden years from 10 to 16 to get them hooked on science for the rest of their life. If you miss it, well, maybe they'll discover it later. <laughs> that's amazing. That That's exactly what happened to me with computers. And now I have to wait eight years for my two-year-old to be ready to become a, a theoretical physicist. That's right. So when your kids hit 10, take them to the planetarium, play computer games with them, read science books, astronomy books, planetariums. Because that's when they realize that mommy and daddy are not the universe. Before 10, everything is mommy and daddy. After 10, they say, well, how big is the universe? And it freaks them out when they realize how big it, the world really is. That's when you got to grab them. Because like I said, you know, your hormones kick in by 16, 17, peer pressure. People say you're a nerd, you're a geek, you know, you're a loser, blah, blah, blah. And it's over. You got to get them during those years. Is that what happened to you? Did your parents hook you up with something? Well, my parents were very poor. And so I knew that I had to make it on my own. <clears throat> no one was going to give me something on a silver platter. And so I knew that I had to do something on my own. So I built an atom smasher when I was in high school. Yeah. I built a 2.3 million electron volt betatron particle accelerator in my garage. <laughs> did, did anyone, was anyone hurt? No, but it blew out every single circuit breaker in the house. My mother kept saying, why can't you date a nice Japanese girl? <laughs> why, did you, why do you build these things? How did you do this? Was this a Radio Shack thing? What was the capacitor? I mean, where was the power? Um, it had 17 miles of copper wire, Yeah. 400 pounds of transformer steel. What did you wrap it around? A high school football field. <laughs> it's um, 17 miles of copper wire. That's fantastic. <laughs> well, uh, we're running out of time because you're getting ready to go on stage here at Tech Ready 6. I really appreciate you taking just a moment to sit down with me here in the green room. Thank you very much, Dr. Michio Kaku. Okay. Okay. 